the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. Wherever you are, open your mouth and worship God tonight. Worship Him now. Worship the name of the Lord. 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 Oh Lord, we exalt you. We magnify your name. We magnify your name. We magnify your name. Exalt him, 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 exalt him. Oh, Rabba Kabo Setede de Bariana Taya. Worship him, worship him, worship him, worship him. Come on now, give him praise, give him glory. Exalt his name. Oh, Rabba Sata Baranati. The Prasana Mandola Baba 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 Baba. Come on, worship him, worship him, worship him. Let your worship rise to heaven tonight. Let it come from your spirit. Let it come from your spirit. Let it come from your spirit. Ora ba 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 ora Oh Jesus If the Lord has ever been good to you open your mouth and worship him Open your mouth and exalt him There's a place we need to reach in the spirit before I begin to teach we have not arrived there yet. Open your mouth and exalt him. Open your mouth and exalt him. Open your mouth and exalt him. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Lama nambo rabina skabarabo sata. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. Give him worship. Give him worship. Give him worship. Some people are just looking around. I don't know what you are looking at. I said, bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Oh, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my death you pay 
from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the skies. Lord, I lift your name. You came from heaven to the earth, Lord. You came from heaven. Come on, worship from your spirit. Everlasting, everlasting, to 
voice and praise him now. Wherever you are, clap your hands, lift your voice, give him glory, give him praise. Eleka-bila-marako-bele-bere-teliate, La pa 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 Il a prosa para taliata Saliate Robi la ma kobele ma Come on now, give him glory Thank you, Holy Ghost. Aha. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That devil is a liar. La rua telemandi kade. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your praises will forever be on our lips. We exalt you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Exalted here today, Lord. Thank you for your presence. 
Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your fire. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for we do not live here the same way we came. Thank you for your precise word. Thank you for deliverances. Thank you, Lord, for anointings. Thank you for baptisms. Thank you for healings and miracles. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Take all the glory, Father. Holy Spirit, as we move a little further, please. Do that which is in the heart of the Father. Let the will and the government of the throne be established in this place. So that none of us will live here the same way we came. That there will be songs of rejoicing. Reality of deliverance. Such that the name of Jesus is glorified. And the Father is highly exalted. Thank you Holy Ghost. For in Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're welcome to Bible study. And we're trusting God that tonight the Lord will do us good. I originally planned that I'll start teaching on time, but when I stepped up, I didn't feel the release as much as I desired. So there was a need for us to travel a little further. So we'll see how God will help us tonight. You can welcome the people by your side to Bible study. Let them know that you are glad that they are here. Praise God. So quickly, we, just to remind us, I just want to do some administrative work for the first five minutes. And then we will see how the Lord will begin with us. <clears throat> Excuse me, this first part of the teaching. Uh, just to remind us that our building project is still on and um, we continue to trust God to begin the first phase which is the foundation. Uh, so we are still get all the documentation and approvals. You know, you can't start constructing without getting appropriate approvals from the government, the building plan approval, and all of that. So we're trying to complete the architectural design, complete the M&E, &E, the structural designs, and all of that, because we need all of those documentation to get the approvals that are necessary. As of today, we, are, we have about more than 50% of the 40 million that is required for the foundation. So if we wanted to start today, we can start today, but we are trying to get documentations right. So for those of you that are still giving, please give the first phase of this project will require 40 million naira. And we trust that Jesus will help us. So those are the account details you can use to partner with us for the building. Second thing is, as relates to giving, is the Wari City Crusade that is coming up in December. From the 13th to the 17th, our budget is 10.5 million. As of today, we have only 1.2 million. And we are trusting God for miracles. There are things that are very, very urgent, very, very urgent, sound, lighting, 
stage that we need to pay for that are time bound. If we don't pay for them now, we'll be in trouble. People will hire them and won't be able to use them. So please um, join us for the crusade. I'm trusting God that this week, those of you that the Lord is speaking to, you will partner with us to see that God's work in our hand progresses according to design. Um, so 10.5 million, we have 1 million. So we need about 9 million Naira in the next two weeks to be able to get this program off the ground. So please, brethren, join us. Those of you following us online, the bank details are provided. Please, you are free. If in other currencies, just reach out to us and we'll let you know the account you can use. Praise God. So just to remind all of us also that we have prayer cells scattered around the state and in, in worry. So please, if you've not joined the prayer cell, do well to do so. We have in Jedo and we have, uh, yes, in Jedo for now, in worry. We have in Sapele. Sapele meets on Saturdays. We have in Asaba. Asaba meets on Thursdays. So if you need to join a prayer cell, do well to do so. If you're a student, we have one in, um, in Ogara. That's the Polytechnic in Ogara. So you can join them. And then we also have one in Delta State University, uh, Braca. We trust that Jesus will show us mercy in the name of Jesus. Are you ready tonight? Yes, sir. Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Genesis chapter 4 from verse 1. I was seeking the face of the Lord, asking him the direction to take after the completion of the letters of Jesus. And it was in that engagement he began to speak to my heart about the revelation of his character and his attributes as the God of deliverance. The God of the deliverance. Now, if you are a Bible student, you will find that in Jesus' revelation of the Father God, in his expression of his calling and his ministry upon the face of the earth, you will see that Jesus also emphasized the dimension of God that is called Eliphelet. Eliphelet, if you are a student of the Bible, you will find is also names of people in the Bible. Even one of the, I think is the sons of David or so, is called Eliphelet. And what Eliphelet means in the Hebrew is the God of deliverance. The God of deliverance. But somebody might be asking, why did we now call it Eliphalet? Because Eliphalet is the variance of the name Eliphalet, which means Eliphalet says the God of deliverance. Eliphalet means the Lord that delivers me. So Eliphalet is the general expression of God in his uh, dimension as a deliverer. In fact, if you translate the word directly, it means a God of release. So Eliphalet actually means God that releases me or God that delivers me. So in the ministry of Jesus, you see that Jesus will teach, Jesus will preach, Jesus will heal, and Jesus will what? Deliver. So there is a dimension of God, there's an attribute of God where God is concerned about the deliverance of his people. This is why salvation in itself, the experience of salvation in itself, is the experience of deliverance. Right? What's that scripture? I think it's Colossians chapter 1 and uh, verse 10. Give me verse 10. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. 
Give me 11, 12, 12, 13. Yes. He has delivered us from what? And conveyed us where? So what this is describing here, if you go and read the entire book or entire chapter of Colossians chapter 1, is, this, is describing what happens to you when you experience salvation. So salvation primarily at the root of salvation is deliverance. And what God delivers you from is the power of darkness. Why does it say power of darkness? Because if you've listened to my teachings repeatedly, I've told you that there are two kingdoms in this realm. There is the kingdom of God and there is the kingdom of what? Satan. Right? It was Jesus who showed us that Satan himself has a kingdom. A kingdom. When they came to him and they said, you are casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub, he said, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Indicative of the fact that Satan himself has a structured kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 6, you see the structure of that kingdom. There are principalities and powers. There are spiritual wickedness in high places. Demons are stratified. So Satan's kingdom is organized and it is structured. And the reality, the expressions of the kingdom of Satan is wickedness. It is darkness. It is oppression. These are the expressions, the manifestations of the kingdom of Satan. The two major realities that you have when you speak about the kingdom of Satan is darkness and wickedness. When you begin to break wickedness down, that's when you now have oppression, you have affliction, you have possession, you have all kinds of manifestations of demonic spirits. So anytime you want to see the manifestation of the kingdom of Satan, the reality that you engage with in the spirit is called darkness. Darkness. Just as in the kingdom of God, the two major realities of the kingdom of God is righteousness and light. Righteousness and light. So when you want to engage with the kingdom of God, if you begin to make contact with the kingdom of God, you will be coming into the environment of his light. That's why some of you who have learned how to engage prayer long, you will find that on certain times when you have prayed for long, you will begin to break into light in the spirit. How many, how many have experienced that before? You begin to see light. Because one of the expressions of the kingdom of God is light. God is light. Have you read that before? God is light and in him there is no what? At all. Why? Because darkness is the reality of another kingdom. So if you find somebody that has not come into the knowledge of God, the reality of their lives is that they are under the power of what? Darkness. You are following me. Of darkness. And that darkness can be expressed in various ways. It can be expressed in ignorance. It can be expressed in wickedness. The other dimensions. You see all the afflictions of the darkness of Satan, his wickedness, his terribleness, his unrighteousness, his immorality, and his ability to destroy destinies. So what happens to you at salvation is actually a matter of government. So when you say, and this is why when you get born again, the process of getting born again is that you declare independence from Satan. Hmm? And then you say, Jesus is what? Is Lord. Are you with me tonight? Stay with me. I'm trying to build because I don't want to hurry this teaching. I was thinking that tonight I will 
do one, I will just do this teaching once. But Jesus said, teach first, then next week we do power. It's not that power won't come tonight. We'll pray for people tonight, but next week we'll do spiritual warfare to deal with certain spirits next week. But I need to teach tonight. Now, let me show you a scripture. So you know how you get born again. Do you know how you get born again? You declare independence from Satan, and then you declare that Jesus is what? Why? Because as Colossians chapter 1 is telling us, what happens to you when you get born again is that you are delivered from the power of darkness, and then you are now conveyed. Give us a simpler translation. Give us NLT or message. Aha. See the way NLT puts it. It says you are what? Transferred. He rescues you, and then he what? Transfers you. So what happens to you when you get born again is that there is a change of location in the spirit. A change of location. And the matter of a change of location is a matter of change of government. So once you are rescued, that is, the, that is a simpli, sim, simplified way of explaining the theological term called redemption. What did I say it's called? Redemption. Because redemption simply means to buy back. So when he says you were rescued, he's saying that you've been redeemed. You've been bought back, rescued from the clutches of sin and death, and then God did not just rescue you and leave you in limbo. One of the terms for redemption, the Hebrew terms, is exagorazo. Exagorazo. Exagorazo does not mean just to buy. It means you buy and then you restore. So you are rescued, but you are now not, um, how, do you, how do you put it now? When you are neither here nor there, what does that mean? What's the word? Huh? Indifferent. You are not, indifferent is good, but that's not the word I'm looking for. You, bless you. You are not neutral. He doesn't bring you out and leave you neutral. He rescues you out of darkness, and then he transfers you. Because your allegiance at every time of your mortal expression must be clearly defined. Your allegiances. When you are in the kingdom of darkness, your allegiance is to Satan. Once you have been transferred to the kingdom of his dear son, which is also called the kingdom of light, your allegiance is to the Lord. Are you with me to that point? So let's look at um, Romans chapter 10, begin at verse 8, or begin at verse 9. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Let me show you how you get born again. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be what? So this is how you get born again. Now this might be a little confusing because King James has a passion for making people confused. So when you want to read King James, you should have other Bibles around you to help to aid your understanding. Are you with me? NLT. If you confess with your mouth that what? And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be... So it means that in salvation, you have to declare independence from Satan. What you are saying is like what we were doing last week, where everybody began to say, food is not my God. Jesus is Lord. Are you with me? That's what happens to you at salvation. You must declare your allegiance, absolute allegiance to the Lord. And then you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Why do you believe that God raised him from the dead? There are two things. One, it means that even the condition of death that you are experiencing is not beyond God. What is the condition of death? You are suffering from spiritual death that was transferred to you by Adam. 
and I will show you the scripture shortly. Stay with me, stay with me, just stay. Tonight is teaching. Where I'm going to, where I'm going to tonight is just to answer the question, why is it that even Christians are also addicts? That's where I'm going. You see, because it's easy to understand if somebody is not born again and he's addicted to sex. Are you with me? It's easy to understand if somebody is not born again, he's addicted to alcohol. Because I'll give you a definition of what addiction is. Hmm? If somebody is not born again, it is normal for them to be addicted to drugs. Because, you know, when we talk about addiction now, the average person or the average believer would have been coming to this meeting and saying, it's not me they are talking about. Because in his mind or in her mind, the only understanding of addiction is sexual. But do you know if you look at the list of the types of addictions, there are more than 500. People are addicted to love. Hmm? So a girl can stay in an abusive relationship because she, she's just looking for who to love her. So anytime she finds somebody that can love her, she becomes a slave. Some people are addicted to pain. Pain. Do you know there's a kind of perverse sexual pleasure? Hmm? Where the way the people get pleasure from the sexual activity is that they'll be, they be flogging them like a goat. Hmm? Somebody will bring out whip. And then when they flog them, many of them say, hey, they say, wow. <laughs> it's a demon, a demon. So, they are addict some people are addicted to pain. Some people are addicted to sugar. Hmm? People are addicted to TV. Addicted to sports. People are addicted to sleep. Some people can sleep on Okada. Okada. So a guy you go follow, he said, now the breeze, now the breeze. <laughs> Which breeze? Oh, guy, de deliver yourself quick, quick. They can sleep on a queue. They are on ATM queue like this. Yes. Sleep is their God. They are addicted to sleep. So there are all kinds of addictions. I'm hoping that in this teaching, you will find your own and deliver yourself from it. Even if by next week, my emphasis is going to be on sexual immorality, sexual addictions. But in the principles I'm going to share, you will find out that the principles are the same. An addiction is an addiction. Right? So at the end of today, my hope is to be able to show you by the grace of God why even Christians find themselves under the control of strange appetites. Sometimes the messages I get are heartbreaking. 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 From those who are struggling with homosexuality to those who find out that they cannot control their sexual urge to where they are sleeping with children. It's heartbreaking. The question is, how does a Christian get to that point? Somebody masturbates and masturbates to the point where he is bleeding. Blood is coming out. He can't stop. How is it that you claim that Jesus is Lord? And yet your life is riddled with signs that you are controlled by another spirit. That's the matter we want to deal with tonight. Because I have found that in the visible realm, man is plagued with a weakness. He somehow does not have the ability to be able to say no 
to his cravings and his desires. But I'm trusting that Jesus will help us tonight. So this is how you get born again. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And I said, the raising of the dead is in two dimensions. One, you are spiritually dead. So if God raised Jesus from the dead, there is confidence and hope that your own life will be restored to the original order. Number two, if God raised Jesus from the dead, there is hope for you in resurrection. Are you with me? Like we did in the series that we have been talking about, that when you die, death is not the end. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then you too, you know that if you die physically, before Jesus returns, you are guaranteed that you will also experience what? Resurrection. So you believe in your heart. So what you are believing is, if Jesus was raised, then I too am a candidate for resurrection. So death is not the end. When these two realities happen in your life, that you have government, you have declared independence from Satan, and you have come under the government of God, and then there is faith in your heart that death is not the end, he says, you will be what? Next verse. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made what? And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are. So Christianity, you've heard me say it many times, is not the joining of a denomination. You don't become a Christian because you joined church. Hmm? So even if your parents have been Christians all their lives and you were born into a Christian home, and from the day you were born, they started carrying you to church. And all you have known all your life is church. If you have never believed in your heart, then you are not right with God. If you have never confessed with your mouth, then you are not saved. You are a church member. You are not yet a part of the kingdom. Are you with me? So Christianity is not the joining of a denomination. Christianity is not a dress code. Christianity is not moral lessons. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't, do, don't talk like... No, no, that's not Christianity. Christianity begins like this. You come into a kingdom and the initiating point into that kingdom is that you are imputed with divine life. Now, will that life regulate the way you dress? Yes. Will that life regulate how you talk? Yes. But it is not how you talk that makes you a Christian. Are you seeing the difference? It's not how you dress that makes you a Christian. I have seen sisters who wear long gowns to cover to their... You can't see any part of their body. But they are masters in the art of sexual perversion. And that is not to say that we are advocates for nakedness. Are you with me? You know by now that we do not advocate nakedness. I'm just trying to tell you that it is not the dress code that defines who a Christian is. It is first life. Then it becomes a pattern of existence. Are you with me to that point? So, the reason God goes through all of this effort to change your government is because Adam, I'm coming to Genesis 4, that's where I'm going to tie this up. Adam, at the beginning of his life, had the opportunity to pioneer a race that will mirror what it is that God said when he had made man. After he made man, he saw that man was perfect, man was good. Man was made in the image of God and man's only allegiance was to God. But Adam, somehow, him and Eve, decided to rebel against God. And in their rebellion, they introduced a lineage of mortals that have now become vulnerable 
to the activities of the kingdom of Satan. Let's situate that in the Bible. Romans chapter 5, let's begin at verse, let's try 12. Romans 5 verse 12. If you've never read the book of Romans, I encourage you, take out time to read the book of Romans. It's a treatise, it's an argument for our position in Jesus. It tries to explain to us what has happened to us on account of the things that Jesus Christ has done. Therefore, just as true one man, what entered into the world? And then what was the consequence of sin? He says, and death, true sin. And thus, death spread where? Because all what? All right. One, two, three, four, five. Come. Just stand and face here. Just face here. Face here. Now, the Bible is saying that Adam was a representation of the human race. Are you with me? And because of what Adam did, sin did what? Entered into the world. So it means that before Adam did what he did, in the world, there was no possibility for what? Are we together to that point? He now says that the consequence of Adam's sin was that death became the reality of everyone. Now, this sin and this death did not stop at Adam. Because of Adam's sin, all became sinners. Are you with me? And because of Adam's sin, everybody who is born into this world, you know when you see a baby, they say it's a bouncing baby boy. As it's bouncing, it is dead. Are you here? He says the reality with which we enter into the physical realm is that there's a consequence of death on everyone. And what is this death that the Bible speaks about? It is both physical and spiritual. Physical in the sense that by original design, man was not going to die a physical death. Man was going to eat of the tree of life and live forever in God's order as holy and separated unto God. But man went and chose of the tree of good of knowledge and evil. So God now drives him out and says, ah, let's put a guard to the tree of life. Lest he eats in this state and then he lives forever corrupted. Meaning that man was going to live forever originally, but he needed to live forever in the original design. Are you here? This is why when we looked at the letters of Jesus, one of the crowns of the overcomer is the crown of what? Life. Eternal life. They are going to live for Jesus, with Jesus. Back to the original order. So everybody comes in as a victim of both spiritual and physical death. This is why the Bible says that the last enemy that will be conquered is what? So we we'll no longer have to die. So everybody is plagued. This is why, in order for God to save man, you will see as we read further now, Jesus needed to come into this lineage as a man. Are you here? So in coming into this lineage, he became sin, not the sinner. Is somebody following? Yes, sir. He made him who knew no sin, sin. Go and read that scripture. He did not say, he made him who knew no sin, a sinner. Jesus was not made a sinner. What was he made? Sin. sin. Why? Because it was sin that entered into the world, and it is sin that is the problem of man, not poverty. 
The problem of man is not that he is sick. He is sick because of sin and death. The problem of man is not that he is broke. He is broke, 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 brokenness. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Being broke, <laughs> I think that's the correct English, is just the fruit of the root. And what is the root? Sin and death. Are we together? So he made him who knew no sin to become sin. So Jesus entered into this lineage. Hmm? And he made him sin. So just as Adam became, opened the door to sin, Christ became sin and opened the door to righteousness. Are you here? So Christ does not continue in this lineage. He now pioneers another set of mortals. Are you here? So, come, come, three of you come. Stand behind me. Go to verse 13 now. Let me show you something. For until the law, sin was not in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What does this mean? Now, until the law came, what Paul is saying here in the book of Romans is, until the law came, men did not know that what they were engaging in was a sin. It was when the law came that we could now point to it and say, Obaro just lied. That is lying. Because there was now a law that said, thou shalt not lie. Are you here? So until the law, the, the fruits, the expressions of sin could not be known. Because sin itself is not lying. Sin itself is not fornication. Sin itself is not arm robbery. Have you listened to my teaching, what is sin? Go and listen to it, it's on Telegram. I think I taught that four years ago or so. What is sin? Sin is not when somebody takes off their trousers and they are sleeping with somebody. Those are all manifestations of sin. Because when he says, through one man, sin entered the world, did Adam fornicate? Did Adam fornicate? Did Adam steal? So what was the sin? That Adam committed that opened the door to sin. We will see it. But he's saying that it is because the law came that we now understand what sin is. So when he says, Thou shalt not covet, that is how we now knew that covetousness is a. Thou shalt not commit adultery, that's how we knew that adultery is a. Do you get it now? Next verse. Nevertheless, death. Reigned. Somebody say reigned. I need you to be conscious of the words that the Bible is using because the whole thing I'm trying to show you is a matter of government. You see, when I say things like, in this realm, the thing that is a priority in this realm is matters of worship. People are wondering, where do you come up with these kind of things? Because... Everything in this realm is trying to get your attention. It's a matter of who is ruling your life. Who is commanding your loyalty? Who is worthy of your worship? That's the battle in this realm. And you see, addictions... At the root of every addiction is idolatry. At the root, you see, I have authority from Jesus to teach this. And I am like Solomon. I have the experience enough to teach this. You know, when Solomon says, vanity upon vanity, he's not, he's not a philosopher. 
is speaking from experience. You know, there are people who went to school and they came out with a degree called welding engineering. And in some of those schools, they did not hold a welding torch. Hmm? They showed them in the picture. They said, you see that place? <laughs> huh? They said, that's where you will put the, the electrode. Say, said, yes, sir. So when you put it, you now hold it like this. In some schools. Some of them came out and they have engineering degrees. Hmm? There are some people that the only way they learned welding was through apprenticeship. They sat down with a welder and they saw the welding torch. They saw the oxygen cylinder. I assure you, they are more practically competent than the one that went to Harvard and has never seen a welding torch before. Are you with me? So when I say the things that I say, I say them by the Holy Ghost and by the, by the privilege of the fact that I am a brand plucked out of the fire. Yes. At the root of every addiction is idolatry. What is your idol? Yourself. You have decided to worship yourself above God. So your desires have become more important to you than the desires of the one that you call Lord. This is why, even though Christians, like I'm going to show you, have been shifted to this new genealogy, many are still slaves of strange appetites. So there are people sitting in this room that can't say no to pornography. Can't say no to immorality. There are people online that even after this meeting now, in the night when everybody has slept, they will see go on the internet to look for a pornographic site. Because it's a matter of worship it's a matter of government. And you see, what I want to do tonight is to show you that you are not helpless. This thing that you keep feeling as if you keep, you keep making excuses. Say, I've, I've tried. I've, I've, I've tried everything. You don't understand. Wait first. Wait. That lie you are telling yourself is called self-deception. And you see, next week we will deal with the dimension that is spiritual. Hmm? But this week we need to deal with the dimension that has to do with your theology. There's something in theological circles that is, stay with me, oh brethren, don't be tired. Oh. You are preaching with me. There's something in theological circles that is called practical theology. What did I call it? Now what does practical theology mean? It means that you are living your theology in daily practice. That's practical theology. That means the things that you believe about God, you are leaving them out on a daily basis. Those are the things that are governing your daily life. That is what is called practical what? Because a lot of people have theology. For instance, there is no Christian here. I don't take the fact for granted that there are some people here who are not yet born again. There is no Christian here that if I ask, is Jesus Lord? He say, yes, he's Lord. He came from heaven to the earth. He showed us the way. I lift his name on high. He's my God. He's my king. He's my God. And his name is Yahweh. His name is Yahweh. Some people even cry. But by the time we need to begin to check your life on a daily basis, we now find out that food. <laughs> hmm? Is actually your Yahweh. Food. 
So the way you are supposed to be singing your own is, He's my God, and his name is Amala. <laughs> his name is fried potato. <laughs> because you know once you see Amala, your senses enter your shoe. And all you need to do is read the Bible. And you will find that when the Bible begins to speak about addictions, it deals with three major addictions. Food, sex, alcohol. Controlling powers. I can add money. Controlling spirits that demand worship from the believer and turn the believer into a slave. At the root of all addictions is what? Idolatry. It's a matter of worship. So when you find an addict, I show you a man or a woman who has chosen to than, that rather than worship God, I will worship myself, my own appetites, my own desires. I was talking to a brother who was struggling with homosexuality and he was telling me, see what happened to me, see what happened to me, see what happened to me. That is why today I'm a homosexual. And I said to him, see what happened to me. Why did I not end up a homosexual? Now you look at me today, the way I love my wife, eh? you will never know I like my wife. Eh? That I was homosexually abused. Even though I was homosexually abused as a teenager, 13 or 14 thereabout, eh? I became one of the baddest boys in the realm of women as a non-believer. It didn't take the appetite for wages, no. So I said, if, you, if, if what I went through is what you went through, how come we ended up different? I don't know the person I need to talk to tonight. Everything that you are experiencing now, the condition of your life now, the slavery you are experiencing now is as a result of the choices you made. You chose your idol and that idol has sat over your life. That's why you are where you are. Whether it is television or sports that has become your God. I think Chelsea is playing Man City now. Some brothers' minds are not in this teaching. Eh? As they are in church now, that phone in their hand that you think they are using to read Bible, they are checking scores. Some are even about to piss in their pants because they have even bet. So when you see the brother do like this, and I lie, it's not the word, it's not the word. Eh? The ticket has caught. So when they are shaking their leg in church sometimes, it's not the word. They have become slaves to another God. The way man was designed is that every man that comes into this realm, he's supposed to say that Jesus is Lord. He says, nevertheless, death reigned rulership from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam who is a what? So Adam was a type of who? Jesus. So you have the first Adam and you have the second or the last Adam. Are you here? 
All these people were suffering, even though they did not commit the same transgression that Adam committed. Give us NLT. It explains it a little better. Verse 14, NLT. Still, everyone did what? From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not what? So what was Adam's sin? Disobedience. Are you here? Adam opened the door to immorality. Opened the door to death. Opened the door to foolishness. Why? He disobeyed what? An explicit command from the Lord. So Adam's sin was disobedience. God said, do not. He now decided he was wiser than God. And now it. And go and look at the way Satan deceived Adam. You know what he queried? God's integrity. He said, did God say you should not eat of every fruit in the garden, of every tree in the garden? He says, he knows that in the day that you eat, you shall become as gods. You shall become wise like one of the gods. So what was Adam saying invariably? I mean, Satan saying to Adam, he was saying, Adam, if you cannot trust God, God lied to you. Invariably, he was saying that he is not worthy of your allegiance, your loyalty, and your worship. That matter was a matter of what? Worship. He said, why are you giving God reverence and honor? He doesn't deserve it. He lied. Do you know that that's what Satan does? I was looking at a statistic. I think it's last night or this morning. I've never seen that statistics before. 80% of HIV victims in the world are homosexuals. How many percent? 80. Because in those circles, many times, when they are penetrating people from behind, eh, they do it without protection. 80% are HIV victims, are homosexuals. Satan will tell you that when you submit to another government that is not God, there is a pleasure you will gain. He will never tell you that when you refuse to acknowledge God as God, he will give you over to a reprobate mind. And when that happens, you will turn that which is natural to an unnatural appetite. When you do not know who your God is, if Satan succeeds to make something else your God, he can cripple your reality in the realm of mortals. I've seen young boys cry. And I'm not joking. I'm not saying fake cry. Cry! Saying, Daddy, help me. I'm tired. Sometimes I go back to my closet and me too, I will cry. How did this person get here? There are dimensions of it that have spiritual connotations, but go and check carefully. I was molested too. As I'm talking to you now, the picture is still graphic in my head. The senior came in the early hours of the morning. I had not slept far. Dragged me out of my net. I was in the hostel. Dragged me into his bed. I was shivering. I was 13 or so, or 14. I was shivering. 
shaking. Senior, he was SS3, I think I was JS1 or JS2 or so, I can't remember. And he made me do things that my mouth cannot say. And then when I came out of that place, Satan had, had sown a seed. Eh? From that minute, I was not looking at men as men anymore. An appetite began to grow. I said, nah, lie. He's not, he's, he's not going to rule over me. I decided to fight back. They that strive for mastery. They are temperate in all things. Paul says, so therefore, I do not run as one that does not have purpose. I do not fight as one that beats the air. I have found out the reason many are addicts, they are afraid to fight. Do you know that the Bible says that cowards will not inherit the kingdom of God? Cowards. People who are not ready for a fight. Christianity is a fight. You know why, bro? There are many things in this realm that will not allow you to be holy. Huh? Aye, I'm going to show you now. Aye, I'm going to show you the three tools that sin uses to enact government upon a man. The flesh, the world, and Satan and his demons. I will deal with Satan and his demons next week, but I will just show you. Eh? Those are the tools that sin uses to bring man to a place of slavery. So even though they did not sin, after the similitude of Adam's sin, they suffered the same consequence. All of them. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was what? Yet to come. So, when Christ came, verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought what? But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man who, wherever you are, say Jesus. Jesus. Come on, say it. Let the devil be embarrassed. Say Jesus. So God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness came through one man who, Jesus Christ. This is why when you want to get saved, you lift your heart, you lift your hand. And it's an announcement to Satan and his demons. I don't serve you. Jesus is Lord. You know what the word Lord means? Master owner. Jesus is my master owner. So sex is not my master. Food is not my master. Bro, this is why in the Christian life, God wants you to live a life that shows Satan that is not in charge. That's why fasting is kingdom life. What are you doing with fasting? You are looking food in the eye. You look at the palm there and you say, Oga, you are not in charge. I will decide when I will eat you. So I cannot, I cannot be sleeping in the night and be dreaming of pandemic. Some of you have eaten your pillow, thinking it was bread. <laughs> you were sleeping in the night and you had a dream that they came to give you hot AJ bread, hot one. Sardine bread, you say, ah. You ate half of your pillow. Fasting is kingdom life. It's about government. You are telling food. You don't control my stomach. Giving is about government. You are telling mammon, you don't have a hold on my soul. The one who gave me can tell me how to spend the money. 
Just today, one of my daughters reached me. We need to do this about school, do this about school, do this about school. God said, send it. So I sent the money. Then I turned off my phone. Went into my closet to be alone with the Lord. While I was there, I prayed. I was asking God to help us in this meeting, begging God, crying. Then I came out. As we were about to come, I put on my phone. And 100%, no, 200% of what I sent had come back. I'd come back. I didn't ask. I, didn't, I just obeyed God. Because giving in this kingdom is a way of telling God, you are in charge of my money and it is not my salary that takes care of my destiny. I live from another economy. I read the story of a woman that was on a radio show and a satanist was mocking her because she said she didn't have anything. And she said God can provide for her. God can send even, he can make a, he can make a way in the wilderness. And he can make springs in the desert. He can cause a raven to come and bless you. Supernaturally. So a satanist wanted to mock God. So he bought all the things and sent to her house. Then he, he, he sent somebody to her. Do you know who brought it? Do you know who brought it? He wanted to laugh at her because she was celebrating. Thank God, God has supplied my need. He wanted to say, it's not God. You people are fake. I'm the one that brought it. And the lady looked at him, the person and said, I don't care who brought it. Because when I have a need, God can compel even Satan to meet my need. So, if there is a need, even Satan still obeys instructions. So, the person is thinking that they want to mock you. They don't know that it's them God wants to use to. To meet the need. So, in the kingdom, there are practical life disciplines that announce who your government is. Next verse. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to what? But God's free gifts leads to our being made right with God, even though we are what? Let's go further. Next verse, 17. For by the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through who? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. 18. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but, God's, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life. 19. This is where I'm going. Because one person disobeyed God, many became what? But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made what? So Christ came and modeled the life of what? Obedience. Obedience. Many Christians don't really believe what they have been taught. See that man of God. Eh? And because of a lack of a life of obedience, the possibility for other governments exists in their space. If you refuse to obey God totally, something else will begin to demand your attention. Something else will begin to want to sit on your life. And this is where addictions begin to break in. Let me define addictions to you so you will get, you will get the gist now. Are you getting blessed tonight? Yes, 
So what is an addiction? Number one. Number one. Habitually, habitually, that is from habit, from the word habit. Habitually meeting a particular need, habitually meeting a particular need, for those of you that are writing, habitually meeting a particular need by choosing or pursuing something other than God. Habitually meeting a particular need by choosing or pursuing something other than God. Habitually meeting a particular need by choosing or pursuing something other than God, irrespective of the negative consequences that occur. irrespective of the negative consequences that occur. Habitually meeting a particular need by choosing or pursuing something other than God, irrespective of the negative consequences that occur. So what are the possible needs that exist? Your need for sex. Your need for food. Your need for companionship. Your need for fellowship. Your need for entertainment. Your need for belongingness. When these needs occur, and then you habitually, repeatedly, right, choose to meet that need by pursuing something that is not God. Even though you know that the consequence of pursuing it will be negative, then you have become an addict. So there are people who, their desire for sex, the only way they choose to meet that need is by looking at pornography. Now they know, there's nobody that does not know. Eh? That this thing I am doing is not healthy. I can become addicted to this thing. But they choose habitually, repeatedly. This is why you know that remorse is not the solution to addiction. No. When you, you, you say, oh, oh, I'm tired, I'm tired. Hey, and then you cry. The person goes back again after two weeks. Remorse is not repentance. Look at the words I use. Choosing. Pursuing. It's a matter of choice. The idol that sits over your life is the one you chose to worship. The one you chose to surrender to. Number two. Addictions. A constellation. A constellation of unscriptural. A constellation of unscriptural. Where is this thing now? Patterns of thoughts and actions. A constellation of unscriptural patterns of thoughts and actions that have become a, a lifestyle. And what do we mean by group constellations? We simply mean group. Group. A constellation or group of unscriptural patterns of thoughts and actions that have become what? A lifestyle. That's an addiction. So when you have begun to think in a particular way, act in a particular way, that it now governs the way you live, you have become an addict. That's how many have become homosexuals. A young brother that I was working with to help break from, from homosexual tendencies, 
he was telling me of groups that are on Facebook, groups on TikTok, social media. They are available everywhere. So they lure young boys. You know, me, me I, I'm talking from experience. Eh? You see, I found out, because I used to ask myself, why is it that, you know, the story is almost always the same? Say, my, there was this neighbor in my compound. He would just be calling me into his house. Then every time I enter his house, he would start fondling my body as a man. And then one day he did this, he did this, and before I knew, I became a homosexual. It's always the same. How do they choose their victims? They look for people who are struggling with self-esteem. They look for people who are going through difficult situations in life. Offer you goodies. It's the same thing for male to female. And female to female. And then they begin to touch your body. Me and my wife were discussing this matter early hours of this morning. I think that was around 8. We are just sharing. And then... She was saying, how will a girl just come now if I was a child and then just kiss me, then I'll be quiet. The thing is, many times, the people that these things happen to, they have power to choose. Eh? They are struggling within themselves because of other things. Maybe their self-esteem has been damaged. Some is greed. So the uncle is taking care of me, he's giving me money. So a pattern, a group of thoughts, a group of actions now form that the person now takes up as their lifestyle. Then when you meet him 15 years later, he tells you, I was born a homosexual. It's not true. Are you with me? Last not least, what is addiction? A condition of slavery. Huh. A condition of slavery. We have something other than God. A condition of slavery. We have something other than God. Controls how you think, how you live, and how you feel. A condition of slavery where something other than God controls how you live, how you think, and how you feel. That's what addiction is. Now, if you look at these definitions carefully, you will find that at the root of all this is the man. What choices is he making on a daily basis? Ah, I saw a scripture today. Holy Spirit. Give me Second Peter, chapter 2. Oh, we can't read it from the beginning. Give me verse 18. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 18. Now, when you get to read Second Peter, Second Peter was talking about, okay, go to verse 1. Let me just show you something. Verse 1 to 3. Verse 1 to 3. So you see it. Talking about false prophets. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers where, and what will they do? They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, who bought them, and bring on themselves what? Swift destruction. Swift destruction. So, what these false prophets do is that they will secretly come in and the destructive heresies. The underlying thing is that they are denying who? 
the Lord. They've broken government. And by their teaching, they are trying to introduce you to also become lawless and without the living God over your life. Forget it that God is going to also bring them to what? Swift destruction, whether in this life or the next. Verse 2. And many will do what? Because of whom the way of truth will be what? So when somebody tells you, masturbation is not a sin. Eh? He's trying to make you comfortable with lawlessness. He's trying to make you tell you that if, you, if it makes you feel good, then it is okay. You know why? Because this world, the driver in this world is self-indulgence. Have your best life now. Somebody now went into studio and came out. And the title of his song is, I Cannot Come and Kill Myself. Eh? You know what he's telling you? Come on now. Enjoy your life. Why are you killing yourself? Why wait for marriage to have sex when sex is on the streets? You don't know how cheap sex is in our generation. You can sleep with anybody anytime now. There are mobile apps that all you need to do is register and, and put your specification inside. You want her to be black, to be short, to be tall, and a strange looking girl. I'm even afraid of young men. Tunde. I can't understand it. A girl you don't know. Even in all my madness, fear still they catch me. <laughs> eh? Huh? That's how people met me, oh, kuku she she. <laughs> eh? As my head, the heart reach, I won't even try it. Fear they catch me. You've never met this person before. Yes, at your door. And you are bold enough to remove your nika or ga. <laughs> I hear you. Even Satan is afraid of you. Because even witches will not be that careless. Hmm. Show up at the house of a witch unannounced. She will need to scan first. She will check. It's when she has gotten feedback. You, somebody you, you met on app. <laughs> no wonder. There are many who name the name of the Lord. Satan has turned them to dogs. He has a chain on their neck. That even though they are doing like this, they can't break free. The kind of things they did that brought them to that situation, even Satan looked at them and said, you get mind. You, you get mind. Satan will tell you that sex, don't wait for marriage. Satisfy your hunger. Okay, if you can't sleep with anybody, just be downloading porn, porn. Oh, if you know what porn, pornography did to my mind. <laughs> if you know what it did to me. That you, you, have, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have stopped watching the pornography. Then you, 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 you kneel down to pray. Paris, You just ascended and you just see breast. <laughs> you don't know. Every point, Satan was waiting with a whip, saying, You will not go further. 
But the Bible says there is one called the breaker. That he stands at the head of his people. Mariano Copila. And what he does is that he breaks open the way. What is he doing? He's Jehovah Elifelet. The God that brings deliverance. Lamanakate. There is no way I could have broken free on my own. But you see what I did was when those pictures will return, I will close my eyes and say, that man died. Sometimes tears will be falling from my eyes. I will say, daddy, that man died. Kedu, kedu. Even when the tongues are no longer flowing, I will refuse. Satan can show me pictures, but he can't force me to open the internet. He can bring naked women. That's the period that as I step out of my house, I'll be seeing girls' breast cleavage everywhere. Then I will determine that when you see it, it's an accident. But if you look at it, it is deliberate. You don't know you are in a fight. And you are taking things for granted. God will never come to deliver a man who is not ready to be delivered. He's a perfect gentleman. He never forces his ways. Never forces his thoughts on any man. We fight not as those that beat the air. We lay our blows with precision. I determined I will never go back. Never. Never. I told Jesus, you are my Lord. And I determined that Satan will not put a leash on my neck. God forbid. So when he came, I wanted to remind me of things I had done before. I want to wear it. I will rem ne not me. It became sin. That they that are sinners could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. He said, because of whom the way of truth will be what? Go to verse 18 now. Oh. Uh. So when he says, for when they speak, who is they now? The false prophets. The false teachers. When they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live where? So those who are born again, those are the ones who have escaped from error. There are those who live in error. That is what the Bible calls the children of disobedience. There are those who have escaped, who have been delivered from the power of darkness and been brought into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, when they are speaking swelling words of emptiness, telling you that even as a Christian, if you are fornicating with a sister and then you die, you are going straight to heaven. That if you are on top of a sister fornicating and Jesus returns, that your, your salvation is already guaranteed in heaven. They are speaking swelling words of emptiness. And you know those are the kind of things my generation like. When they hear it, they say, God. You are teaching good, sir. You are teaching good. Go deeper. Emptiness. Emptiness. They are trying to allure. What is this word? Tempt. Entice. Those who have escaped. 19. 19. While they promise them what? I can't hear you say what. What's the word? That word liberty is a word of government. Are you hearing me? Nobody, take away, nobody is designed to live liberty in this realm. Now somebody will say, but the Lord came to, to give us liberty. The minute he gives you liberty from sin and death, he brings you to become his slave in his kingdom. Are you with me? So he says, it is they that do the will 
of my father that will enter into the kingdom of heaven. They that have submitted themselves as slaves to my commandments and my leadings. So he sets you free so that he can bring you under government. So even though you have, you have been made free, you are in liberty. At the same time, you cannot use your liberty as occasion for the flesh. You are still under government. You see why they promise them liberty? They themselves are also are slaves of what? For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into what? Hmm. See, this is a simple story there. Whatever overcomes you is your master. Are you here? If pornography has overcome you, it has brought you what? Into bondage. He's your God, your master. This is why we yield to Jesus. When Jesus overcomes us, then we are his slaves. He's our God and our king. And we don't live for food. We don't live for sex. We don't live for money. We pledge allegiance to Jesus. Give me this verse in NLT. Then we we'll go for that. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of what? For you are a slave to what? Ask your neighbor quickly, what controls you? Don't be afraid of your neighbor. Look in my ball to eyeball and say, oh God, what controls you? Check! There are some Christians that are controlled by sex. Lust controls them. Greed controls them. Anger controls them. And the thing is that once control is involved, you are a slave to whatever controls you. That's why you, you need to learn how to submit to the Holy Ghost and allow him to control you. 20. Let's go quickly now. My time is up. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are what? So when Jesus saves you, eh, bless him, and then you by your own hand, you go and be entangled. You say, you say, immorality. Me and immorality. Me and immorality. Me and immorality. Eh? He says that you are worse off than when? Than before. So those that never came out to the kingdom of, of the dear son, those that were never rescued, their case will be even be better than your own. Are you hearing me tonight? You, you have come out. But when it comes to the arena of worship, you have another God that is not Jesus. Your case eh, will be worse than before. I had a friend, when he watches pornography, when he hears this kind of teaching, he will bring out all the CDs and burn it. And then he will be crying. Go! If I watch again, kill me. Hmm. God doesn't want men and women that he forced to love him. The proof of your love is in your obedience. The question for you tonight is, will you choose to obey your desires? Or will you choose to obey Jesus? Will you make an idol out of your appetites? Or you will bend the knee and bow your head to Jesus alone. 21. It will be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject what? To a holy life. You see, next week I will talk about the holy life. <laughs> the commandment is to a holy life. 
a life separated and dedicated to God. A holy life. 22. I think that's my last verse. They prove the truth of this proverb. What is the proverb? A dog turns to his vomit. And another says what? A washed pig. Dogs return to their vomit. God has brought you out and washed you. But you keep going to your vomit. So why do Christians eh, end up as addicts? Because they refuse to choose Jesus above their desires. Genesis chapter 4 and I think it's verse 6. You remember this story? Cain and Abel bring their offerings to the Lord. They give their offerings to God. And then the Bible says that God rejected Cain and his offering. And he was favorable towards Abel and his offering. Now, when God rejected Cain's offering, the Bible says Cain's, Cain's countenance fell. Huh? His countenance fell. So when that happened, God saw him and he came to him and said, Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, Why do you look so dejected? Give me New King James. New King James. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Seven. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Is that not the question? And if you do not do well, what happens? This is the whole thing I've been trying to teach since morning. Sin is lying where? At the door. God made Jesus sin. So that the sinner can become righteousness. But you see sin? Sin is still roaming around. Looking for a favorable ground. Where is he lying? At the door. And his desire is for who? Reach to your neighbor. Say sin's desire. Sin's desire. Is for you. It's for you. No, preach to the other neighbor. Say sin. It's coming after you. It's desire is for you. But you should do what? Give me NLT now. NLT. You will be accepted if you do what? If you obey Jesus. But if you refuse obedience, then watch out. Sin is what? Crouching at the door. Eager to do what? It's about government. But you must subdue it and be what? When Christians lose this battle, that's how they become addicts. This matter that the Bible is talking about, oh my God, time is gone. This matter the Bible is talking about here are matters of choice. Sin is crouching at the door. Waiting for you to make the wrong choice. Once you make the wrong choice, you empower it to control you. So the day you choose to open pornography, sin is crouching at the door. The minute you open it, then it says, aha, you have given me legal access. I will deal with legal access next week. You have given me authority. And the desire of sin is to do what? Control you. Wants to control how you live. How you think. It doesn't want you to go after the natural order of a man that loves a woman. It now begins to make you to love men. As a man, men begin to look attractive to you. It begins to control you. You now begin to act like a thief. You become immoral. Small thing. You have told a lie. Sin has now become your God. Is it tonight? The Lord told me that I will deliver men from the power of sin. 
There are many of you, your will, your thoughts, your soul have been captured by this demon. I wanted to show you the three methods sin uses, but I'll begin there next week. There's no time. Capture. Now you can't even sleep at night. Your body aches. Yearning for all kinds of appetites, all kinds of desires. Breaking into things that are anti your consecration with God. He says, sin's desire is for control. And once it begins to master you, that's how slaves are born. Slaves. What Isaiah chapter 61 verse 1. <laughs> Isaiah 61 verse 1. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to manifest that Jehovah Eliphelet to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Before Jesus came, before God our deliverer came, every man was in prison. And while we were in prison, the gates were locked. Some of us tried to get out. I know this. I said, I'm tired of the alcohol. We tried to get out. But the gates were locked. You know what Jesus did? He came down into, into, into the earth. And he walked to the, to the prison. He removed the padlock and opened the door. And then he went and stood afar off. And he shouted. The Bible says, to proclaim liberty. He shouted, you are free. So every man that was in prison... All you need to do is raise your head. Looking unto Jesus. If you believe what he says. Then you can walk out of jail. That's how many of us got born again. We heard him cry. He said you are free. You are no longer bound. And that's how many of us walked out. Rise on your feet tonight. Some of you need to walk out. You need to walk out of pornography. Walk out of masturbation. Because you are free. You are free. If you believe Jesus. If you believe Jesus. You are free tonight. The prison doors are open. The prison gates are open. Pray now, wherever you are. Pray now, wherever you are. Jehovah. Elifalet, God that delivers me. Bro, you are not a homosexual. Dear lady, you are not a lesbian. Where you are is a product of the choices you have made. You are not a thief. You are not a fornicator. The Lord is here in all his glory. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Where you need to repent, repent tonight. Daddy, I have worshipped myself. I have loved myself. I have bowed down to the idols of immorality. But tonight, 
I announce that Jesus alone is my God. Where are you, pray? I'm giving you three minutes. The power of God is going to come down here. breaking tonight I see chains that are breaking tonight I see appetites that are changing tonight on site online the Holy Ghost he moves Someone in the congregation, the hand of the Lord is coming upon you. It's to break the yoke of darkness. I see the Lord. He puts his hand upon you now. His hand comes upon you now. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Like raw fire. Descend. Descend. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. My God, my God, my God. There's one person I need to pray for. And the way we identify this person, the hand of the Lord will come upon you. A demon has taken over your appetites. And you know what I'm saying? You become a slave. I ask that the Lord will put his hand upon you. The Lord will put his hand upon you. Holy Ghost, help me find that person. Ushers, you will bring that person to me. I need to lay my hands on that person. That one person tonight is your night. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Yes, he's coming now. He's coming now. He's coming now. Fire of God. Fire. Yes. 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 the person to me 
devil is a liar. That devil is a liar. In the name that's above every other name. You foul spirit. Leave. 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 By the fire of the Holy Ghost. Get out. I said get out. Get out. Leave this body now. The Lord sets you free. The Lord sets you free. Whoosh. Wherever you are, shout Jesus. Wherever you are, shout Jesus. this God time the Lord will release fire some of you your anointing that you lost the grace of God that you lost sight in the spirit that you lost somebody shout Jesus take it I said take it I said take it fire of God 